Welcome everybody to Cheese In Depth. I'm Michael Landis and today we get to play with Vermont Creamery, one of my favorite people and creameries. Uh, we have a long history together. We started off uh, working many, many years ago together. Uh, we did a little event in New Jersey and uh, I've always considered Adelina a very good friend of mine and I'm very, very excited to have her join us today on our little talk. So, Ellen, welcome. Thank you for having me, Michael. I'm outside in my backyard and it's a beautiful day, uh, although the neighbor just called and said that there is a bear uh, around our neighborhood. So if you see me running uh, inside my house, just don't panic. It's just because, you know, we live in the wildlife here in Vermont. I'm very excited to be joining you, Michael, and, and you all to talk about Vermont Creamery, to talk about cheese. I hope you all got your box of goodies and uh, you have your display of um, yummy, delicious um, cow's milk cheese and goat's milk cheese. Awesome. All right. Should we eat some cheese? We should. We should. I think we should, right? right. I, think, I think we definitely need to do that. So. All we'll right. So we should, um, so the pairing, I, you know, Michael said four to five cheese. I mean, you can see the family. We, it's like we have three dozens kids at, at Vermont Creamery. So picking four, only four cheeses was probably the hardest challenge, more than getting set up on Zoom and, and doing the display <laughs> here. It's like asking who's your favorite children, right? Um, so four cheese. Is we're gonna have uh, fresh goat cheese because we gotta start with what's pure and plain. It's like a fresh glass of milk. Then we're gonna move on to um, cremant, the cream of Vermont. Um, then we're gonna have a little bon bouche. Uh, yeah, you almost gotta be a, a French speaker to pronounce this one. Um, and then we're gonna finish with a cow's milk product called San Albans. So I have the cheeses with me, and then what I'm gonna do is walk you through uh, those, and we're gonna talk pairing, and please ask questions, because I'm, I'm talking a lot, and I wanna make sure that any, any thought, any wondering, I can answer them as we go through. So the fresh goat cheese, um, what I thought we would do is, first of all, show you um, a trick, it's called Easy Peel. So um, you can open that little log of goat cheese and I love to put it on the dish because um, it's a simple cheese, but you can really impress people with it. So little log of fresh goat cheese. And what I wanted to show you is how to like up the goat cheese a little more with our friends from Fat Toe Farm. Um, it's um, goat's milk caramel made in Vermont with milk from Ayersbrook Goat Dairy. So there is something called um, Goat Town in Vermont where there is Ayersbrook Goat Dairy, which is um, the goat dairy farm of Milos Hooper, Alison's Hooper's son. There is also the Vermont Glove Company that is made with um, goat skin uh, hives and then Fatto Farm, which makes amazing caramel with uh, the milk of um, uh, Ayers Brook. So it's like this dulce de leche. It's very sweet and it's uh, delicious. So you can drizzle um, a little bit of of the caramel onto the goat cheese or what I like to do is a cracker, whoops, fresh goat cheese and then caramel on top of it and it literally tastes like a s'mores. I'm serious. It's like you have your marshmallow, you have the caramel being like your chocolate and then your graham cracker, which is your regular cracker. So um, fresh goat cheese on steroid here, people. <laughs> so how is fresh goat cheese is made while you, while you eat and uh, our delicious fresh goat cheese, either plain or um, with uh, the little um, assortment I just made. So first of all, we take the milk that uh, I spoke about, um, and uh, we pasteurize it at a high temperature uh, because it's uh, it's a fresh cheese, so it's not aged. Uh, and so we pasteurize it at a high temperature to kill the bacteria um, uh, that are in the, the raw milk. And then we're gonna put this uh, 
fresh goat's milk into big tank. Think about if you have been in winery or cider places, you know, those like stainless steel tanks that are closed in. So we put the milk in there and then we're gonna add uh, cultures like bacteria, uh, live bacteria that we carefully select. And that's the role of the cheese maker to make sure that they pick the right mix of lactic acid culture. Um, and then we add it in the milk and then let the, it's the magic, the science, the work of the bacteria happen over 20 hours. And this is pretty long and probably longer than most other goat cheese makers at scale, commercial goat cheese makers are doing, but it's very important to let those bacteria eat the sugar, the lactose in the milk to turn it into lactic acid. And as this um, acidity builds up in the milk, it's gonna make the protein of the milk come together, coagulate to then form a gel. And so that's how we go from a fluid milk into a tank to something that looks like a very fresh yogurt. And so 20 hours is very important for us because we want to slowly build that binding of the protein. We don't want to rush it because it's going to impact the, the texture of the cheese. Then the next day we have this incredible, beautiful yogurt-like, and then we're going to take it gently and drain it in, into a cheesecloth. Very simple, we have big bags uh, of cheesecloth that we press gently against each other. And what it's going to do is separate the whey that drips on the floor from the curd, the fresh curd. And once we get to that right texture, that right moisture into the curd, this is when we take the curd, take it off the bags, um, you know, cool it overnight into a little cooler, and then only we can take it and shape it into um, logs, fresh logs of goat cheese. Some of our goat cheese, we roll it in, you know, Herbe de Provence or like I have in here, um, blueberry with candied lemon peel or cranberry. Every single ro roll is, um, um, logs is rolled by hand. And so when you taste fresh goat cheese, the first thing is it shouldn't taste goaty. It shouldn't be tasting like the buck or you are like next to the manure pet uh, on the farm. It should taste really clean and really fresh. Uh, a little bit of salt, but not too much. And we usually add very little salt because we want them, we want the milk to shine through. We don't want to, we don't want to hide it. We, we want this pure freshness of goat's milk to come through into the cheese. Something also that I really love about our goat cheese is that um, there is such an incredible fluffy texture. You know, goat cheese shouldn't be goaty, number one, and number two, it shouldn't be sticking to your palate. It shouldn't be like you're chewing on, you know, cream cheese or toothpaste. Um, it should be very fluffy, it should be very delicate, almost like melting um, of a, like, you know, um, cheesecake, you know, very, very light. And so that's very important for us to get that texture. And the way we do it is again, we drain it in cheesecloth very slowly. We then make the logs by hand. Um, it's very important for us that we get that amazing texture uh, because once you put it in your mouth, it's like, oh my God, it tastes so good. So that's how goat cheese is made and should be enjoyed. I put it on a, on a little piece of cracker here for a little appetizer. But really goat cheese can be used on anything. And it's crazy to think that, wow, it took 40 years to get there, but you know, you can now put goat cheese on pretty much anything. It's like topping on salads, on cheese board, um, you know, on pizza. Uh, I certainly feed my kids a lot of goat cheese um, and, um, and they love it. So um, to go with this, Michael, I had picked um, a local spirit, Citizen Cider. I thought, you know, go Vermont or go home. <laughs> So it's um, this cider company um, is, a, is a local um, producer uh, located in Burlington, Vermont, Northern Vermont. Uh, they've been in business. They started in 2010 and uh, Unified Press is their flagship cider. It's a semi-dry cider. I mean, it's 90 degree right now here in Vermont. So I thought that would be just a perfect 
sep, it's, it has some sweetness, which balances the acidity of the goat cheese. So that's what I'm drinking right now with our fresh chef. What do you think? Well, I think that's a great choice. Uh, I have been drinking Sierra Nevadas I've since uh, the 70s when they came out, uh, you know, and uh, it's been always my go-to when it comes to fresh goat cheese. Uh, it's a pale ale that has some hoppiness to it, not too much, but what it does is it brings out more of the butter of the, of the goat cheese. And you know that tanginess, that little lactic acid, it kind of blends in and so you get a little bit of the grain that comes out. So you get the nice grain of kind of like biscuit, you get butter in there, and then just a little bit of tang. And so I've been pairing that for a long time. I just love that pairing. And as for uh, what I'm going to do with the others uh, on this is that on my board, I have blueberries because you put blueberries in it. And, uh, you know, you, you do you generally use a little bit of bourbon in that. But I also have uh, these Effie's, uh, they're, they're cakes. And oh my God. that is really for, for something that you need a little bit of uh, extra oomph and uh, also we need a little stability. So I use the Effie's oat cakes on that. And then I dig into a little bit of the cheese, just like you did. And uh, I kind of smear it on there a little bit and then get a couple of little uh, blueberries going in. Hopefully they don't roll off too far. And then of course, honey. This keeps honey. it all together. And so this is uh, Savannah Bee Honey, 80% pollen count. Oh my God, this is just amazing on its own. So you can just see that uh, the honey and that together, uh, just magnificent. And how pretty it looks. It looks like a hors d'oeuvre that is super fancy and it's like, no, it's a cracker and a goat cheese, but mm. it's a really good cracker and a really good goat cheese, right? Yeah. And that, you know, when people say, oh, I don't, I don't like goat cheese. I mean, <laughs> I'm like, oh, then I'm on a mission <laughs> to convert you. So the first question I, I always ask, like, you don't like goat cheese because you had a bad piece of goat cheese before, tell me more, number one. And then number two, you know, for to convert people that supposedly don't like goat cheese, I always use honey as a trick, right? Once you put the, this, this very dense honey and sweetness on top of this fluffy and acidic goat cheese, you really like, oh, I didn't realize. I thought goat, goat cheese was goaty. I thought it was strong. I thought it was, Hard. It's like no. So it, it matters the quality of everything. You know that mm -hmm. the blueberries they they need to be fresh, not frozen. Your uh, crackers they they need to be handmade. These are Epi's handmade, so they're they're really just so fresh and um, delect uh, just delicious. And then of course you know anytime that you're using the honey, uh, you know anytime you can get a whole comb. Uh, you know, that's always a nice little bonus and yeah. through there. So when when we were developing, so we, you know, we we make our fresh plain, which is the cheese that I uh, recommended, but we have one with, you know, blueberry, uh, it's white blueberry, candied lemon peel and thyme. We have another one that is um, smoky pepper jelly. And, and we wanted to do a honey goat cheese because we so often teach about put honey into your goat cheese. So we thought at some point we're going to need to come up with this combo. But finding the perfect honey and making sure that it's not cut, you know, with, you know, blended with imported honey from this and that and, and being able to source honey at scale, you know, where we could use it in the mix of our product with, you know, the paperwork to ensure that it's pasteurized and, and check all the, the, the check mark, but also a honey that we know where it's made, the producer and really trace it all the way to the farm it took us a year believe it or not and then we were tasting honey and then honey powder versus real honey it's a big difference and we're like we have to stick with liquid honey it's so much better it tastes like the real deal and that's so important to us but we always tell the story on how obsessed we were for a year to find the perfect honey to blend with our cheese 
yeah that's that's for mom creamery in a nutshell all right so should we move on to the to the next cheese what would the you cheese? like to do um the next one i think is cremant okay let's do cremant let's there do we it. go okay so cremant so um, as you can tell by its name, Cremant means the cream of romance. And why we created this cheese? So we, we, we first pioneer geotrichum rinded cheese. And when you look at your piece of bonne bouche, you look at your Cremant, you're like, you look at the rind, it's similar. It's like wrinkly, a little weird, um, very different than I would say uh, penicillium soft ripened cheese, such as a brie, a camembert. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that we create a cheese that um, brings people into the world of geotrichum, uh, right, and cheese. Like make sure that we have a cheese that is approachable, where people would grab it because it doesn't look as funky and weird as, for example, a bon bouche. Try it and understand how amazing geotrichum rinded right, cheese is and then go and explore the more complex uh, cheeses we make. So we thought goat's milk with cow's milk to just tone down the the the, the goatiness and then let's add cream to it because you can't go wrong with fats um and so we called it a double cream so that it's pretty high level of fats and and cream contents in that product and it also has 90 percent cow's milk and 10 percent goats so um, you probably got your cremo in this little plasticky clamshell and you probably opened the clamshell and said, okay, let's get to the cheese. I want to talk to you about packaging. Why packaging is so important as a cheese maker is because, let's be real, we work so hard to make that cheese and farmers work so hard to produce that milk. But once the cheese leaves the creamery and, you know, we're in northern Vermont, then you lose control over your baby. And so then it gets through trucks, pallets, distribution, cross dock in another warehouse to the distributor, then to another warehouse, to at some point to the warehouse of the customer. And then only it gets to the consumer. And so if you make a great cheese, but then it has a packaging that is not sustaining all that stress that you do through the transportation and supply chain all the way to retailer, you basically um, are ruining the work, I would say. So we spend years and years to perfect that packaging, to perfect that, that protection for our cheese because we wanna make sure it's not only perfect when we ship it from Vermont, but it's also perfect when people buy it at the store. So it has um, a little bit of opening in the front. If you take the sleeve, you're going to discover that it has openings also on the side and believe it or not the um, opening depth has been um, measured and researched deeply it also has those little dots on the bottom that lift up the cheese to create some breathing to make sure that the cheese uh, rind is not suffocating is not you know melting Anyway, I'm, I may be going too far on packaging, design, and engineering one-on-one, but it's so important to the cheese. And those cheese, by the way, you cannot wrap, that, wrap them in cellophane. It's going to kill the rind, and then it's going to be super uh, ammoniated, and, um, and then it's going gonna, it's gonna to taste really, really bad. So now that you know everything about cheese storage and cheese packaging, no cellophane, Pay attention to the condition of your cheese and if you don't eat all that cheese and want to save it to use it again or, or taste it again, put it, I would say, in Tupperware. Put it into a, uh, either back in its clamshell or in a little, um, yeah, Tupperware where there is breathing room all around. Close it because your fridge is going to stink. Um, but do not wrap those cheeses in cellophane. You're going to kill it. All right, so let's dive in. Wow, that's a soft, that's a soft cremant. That's all that yummy fat in there. So you can see how yellow it is compared to fresh, the fresh goat cheese that you tried. And the reason being is it's because of that cow's milk and that cream, cream fresh we put into the, into the curd. So why don't you try it? 
taste it and then I'm gonna tell you how it's made. Wow, mine is strong. Oh, it's good. I've Very been soft. looking forward to this all day long. <laughs> mm. This is such a, a beautiful cheese. You know, you can see the creaminess right around the edging here. It's got yep. a beautiful rind on it. Mm. It is good. It is really good. And, you know, what I like about Cremant is you know if you buy it young and it's still you know hard and not hard but it's all together um you're gonna get this 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 fluffiness into the cheese it's gonna be very mild you know and that was in purpose to keep that cheese mild so it's again approachable um but then as you let it age and hold on to it a little more it developed this complexity this the sweetness and hazelnut that is from the cow's cream a little bit of it, it gets saltier because the rind condense uh, and the paste condense and then you get umami taste and then you know again what i love so much about cheese is it's a living and breathing thing and so from young to age it's going to evolve and surprise you with more and more ar aromas that develop throughout i would say it's shelf life and then and then it gets super strong and if at some point the cheese tastes like too ammoniated like you need a spoon really to just eat the cheese this is when i would say it's time to retire that cheese um and and uh, and that's why packaging is so important is to protect the cheese for as long as possible through its shelf life. Um, so how we make that cheese, it's, it's a similar process, I would say, to, to the fresh log, other than um, the selection of the bacteria we put uh, to culture the, the milk is different. We add some uh, yeast in addition of starter culture, um, um, and we also add a little bit of mold into the milk. After 20 hours, we have this great fresh curd that is formed. Then we're going to put it into cheesecloth, like I desc described for the fresh chef. And then we let it slowly, slowly drain. And sometime it takes uh, 24 hours, sometime it takes 28 hours. It really depends on the season. Every single one of our cheese, we don't standardize the milk. That means as milk um, uh, component fluctuates, throughout the year so in the summer there is very little fat and protein in the milk versus during the winter it's very rich fat and protein content in goat's milk um, you know we have to adapt as a cheese maker constantly we start with a milk that varies and then we have to make sure we know our cheese technology and recipe to constantly um, make sure we tweak it to always have a cons consistent cheese um, as, as consumer enjoy it so sometimes it takes longer than uh, other day uh, to drain the curd and then we shape that curd. It's, it's, it's very soft so we use a form uh, with a little hole in there and then we will put the fresh curd in it. We, we slatter it, smash it and then gently take the forms out and then we have those beautiful cremants that are on um, uh, racks. Then what, what happened is we're going to put those cheeses then in um, aging rooms and we have um, 12 of those and each one is designed with a temperature humidity and ventilation specific to that cheese so for example we have a, um, an aging room that is designed for for the cremant and um, we control the temperature we control the humidity to ensure that we create the perfect environment for that yeast that we put it in the milk originally to start growing from inside out to create the rind so it's 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 a simple process on how you go to a fresh goat cheese to an aged goat cheese is really by adding um, yeast and mold into the milk and then by putting that cheese into a, a affinage um, you know environment to let the rind develop and um, i use the fancy and technical word of geotrichum that's the type of yeast we use to grow this rind. And we like to, to call ourselves uh, uh, as better maker, but also wrinkle growers. That's our job. 
our job is to let this geotrichum um, develop on the surface of the cheese and how we measure that we have a rind that is where, where it should be is by looking at the wrinkles, making sure those wrinkles are um, you know, wrinkly, that they are attached to the cheese, that they are small but not too small. Um, and that affinage uh, cycle takes about 10 to 15 days, again, depending on the seasonality and the richness of the milk. Uh, and so every day we look at the cheeses, every day we have to flip those cheeses to make sure the rind develops on the top, on the bottom, on the side. And, and it's a very delicate work. And I would say it's something that is hard to teach. We certainly, we don't have a geotrichum rind uh, onboarding uh, curriculum at Vermont Creamery. The way you learn it is by looking at those rind, looking at those wrinkles growing day after day and start building your know-how by observing and, and by, by knowing when the wrinkles are, are, are good enough or great enough uh, to, be, um, to be turned into a cheese that is ready to be packaged. What do you think of the cheese, Michael? Oh, well, I've been waiting and waiting. I've been so patient. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> Eat the cheese. <laughs> uh, you're, you're doing a great job. Thank you. I really love that. Uh, so, you know, there, there's, of course, that creaminess, the extra butter cream that's in here. And there's that wonderful tanginess. Never, you know, this is a cheese that everybody could love. It's just so nice. So yeah. I'm putting this on a very simple uh, fl uh, little flatbread. It's a sourdough mm -hmm. uh, with... Uh, uh, rustic bakery and it's rosemary and olive oil and mm. so the rosemary on this but there's another part that i add to it is taste elevated has uh, car, uh has uh candied uh oranges which orange oh. rosemary cream butter mm. <laughs> Can go wrong. <laughs> Can go wrong. Well, that sounds like a great pairing too. Um, so we have two more cheese to go. And if you're at home and already had ate all the cheese, there is I have no problem with that. Usually people are like, you know, we're gonna get going, we're gonna eat the stuff while you talk. So all right, well, what are you free. drinking with it? Oh, I'm still on the citizen cider. However, I wanted to show you, I my dad brought me this amazing bottle of Crément du Jura. And I thought maybe I should open that to just make sure my French heritage comes through here. But you know what? I'm 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 Vermont all the way, so I'm still a citizen cider. What about you? Uh, a little prosecco. You know, I wanted uh -huh. something sparkling. I wanted something a little sweet I, with the um, uh, oranges and with the the rosemary and the butter and the cream. A prosecco. You need something to help clean out the palate just a little bit because it's so big. Yeah. This makes it really, really simple. You don't need, you know, to go crazy with this. You no. Know, this such a great, easy to pair cheese that, you know, this is easy. So a little Prosecco. That's perfect. And when people ask me, like, you know, people are so intimidated by cheese, by wine, by pairing. It feels su still such a big deal. It's like, just get over it. Just those cheeses are super approachable. And if you don't know what to pair, pick a sparkling wine pick a Prosecco, you can't go wrong with goat cheese, you pick a light crisp wine or sparkling wine and you can pair that wine with all the cheeses we put it on the on the plate here today. Well what I always tell people is that if you start off with a, a wine or sparkling or a beer that you love and the cheese that you love, even if they don't work perfectly together, you still have a great wine, you still have a great cheese, so you're gonna be okay. Nobody's gonna go to jail, you know? Is that, it's there. like marriage, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that sounds so similar. <laughs> All right, so the next cheese we're gonna try is called Bon Bush, and as you can see, it has this beautiful little wooden crate. Again, very well designed so the cheese can, um, you know, continue to age. The plastic wrap has micro perforation, so it acts like a micro cave because the cheese is going to still age um, while while we ship it. Again, look at those beautiful wrinkles. They are just they make me happy. Um, so, Bonbouche hand ladle cheese, a hundred percent goat's milk cheese. Why is it gray? Well, because we sprinkled salt and ash on the surface of the cheese after we had ladled it 
drain it into little forms, no cheesecloth on this one, but hand ladled in little colander type forms. And then when the cheese has drained for, you know, some time it takes 24 hours and some time it takes 48 hours to drain. Again, back to the milk seasonality. Um, so we sprinkle in salt and ash after the cheese is unmolded. And then we age uh, the cheese for 14 days. First, we take bonbouche and put it into a, a séchoir, a drying room where it's like high wind, um, low moisture and high temperature. And the goal here is um, to dry the surface humidity of the cheese. Think of this cheese as it's young, it's like a panna cotta. It's very, very fragile, very, very soft uh, and humid. So we need to drain that moisture out and then get the geotrichum rind to start growing. And so three to four days into the aging room and then after that about seven days into um, Three to seven, three to four days into the drying room, and then the aging room after that. And again, it feels very scientific, very uh, specific. But again, wrinkles are super hard to grow um, on cheese, and so we have to be very meticulous about controlling the environment to develop this amazing, amazing rind. So. The satter is very soft um, and almost crumbly like fresh chev. And then you can see that the, the surface is very, very wrinkly. The paste is very um, soft on the outside. It's because the cheese, you know, the, the rind continue to develop, then breaks down um, the paste underneath the rind that creates that cream line. But once you try it, you're going to see that bonbouche is a little salty. Um, it's very mild. Um, it has, um, you know, goatiness to it as it should be. And the texture is like this panna cotta. It's so fluffy. It's like a mousse. And again, it's due to the fact that we are hand ladling the cheese. Yum. So this cheese, you and I uh, worked together in New Jersey for a grand opening of a cheese shop. And that was the first time that we had met and you had driven down to be able to come down to be able to see it. And we did a, a bunch of pairings with your cheeses. Oh, look at that. You can see how, how much cream is coming off of here. Oh, yeah. this is just, you know, this is just something that I eat all by itself. I don't share this with anything <laughs> else, you know? That could get <laughs> I, you in honestly, trouble. You know, th this, this is just, just it by itself. Yeah, and it's the hardest cheese to make at Beaumont Creamery. That's why we have a little soft spot for bonne bouche, which means um, good little mouth in French, um, if you wonder. So the last cheese, last but not least, this is called Saint Albans. Hang on, I, hang on. Oh, okay. One last thing. Oh. So we pair this are you up. Drinking. Yes, yeah. you can't forget drinking. <laughs> French, you should be drinking. All right. Yeah, I am. I am. <laughs> All right. So, so uh, with this, I, I went with a uh, Irish red. I want a lot of maltiness to come out on this, but I don't want it to be like a porter or a stout. Um, I want some sweetness. And so, uh, this is a local brewery. This is Eight One Bay. Um, they do a really nice um, Irish red, and so oh. that's my choice of a uh, drink. I'm gonna have to try. That's bold. Usually, you know, like no red wine, no porter or, or, or dark beer. Good? Mm. He's dancing. I think that means it's good. What the, it's like having uh, uh, a toasted bread with this, mm. that maltiness, the toastiness uh, that you get off of a, a really nice French bread that's been toasted all the way to the end. It's just got a really nice balance. There's some nice sweetness on here. You know, mm. just simple and easy. I'm gonna have to try. I, I like to try new thing. That's that's an unusual pairing. That's risky, but it feels that it's the right one. So, well, that's the thing. But pairing, drinking, it's like love. It's in the eyes of a whole. <laughs> All right. Can I go last but not least? It's called San Alban's cheese. It's in oh. this beautiful leather crock. And um, the name comes from the town of St. Albans, uh, where we source our cream from. Um, this is a cow's milk cheese, and um, 
and it's um, again has geotricum rind on it. What I love about this cheese is it's a you can bake with it. It has this um, you know terracotta crock, uh, and you can put the cheese in the oven for a couple minutes, and then use that as a fondue for two or as a fondue for one. In my household, it's like a single serve, this piece of cheese, but you know, we are a cheese gig family. Um, but again, if you, if you slice this cheese, it, um, it's very unique. If you come to Roman Creamery and go into the aging room where St. Albans is being aged, it smells like sweet corn and um, granite smith. It's crazy. I mean, the, the, you walk into the room and the smell is like, oh my God, where is that coming from? It's coming from the cheese and it's coming from the milk. Um, so very aromatic cheese, cow's milk cheese. Um, and as you can see, this one is a little bit crumbly because it's still, I would say, pretty fresh. If you hold on to that cheese, um, I would say for 20, 30 more days, it's going to the paste is going to break down and then you're going to have something that you can really spread um, and, and enjoy more like as a very soft spreadable cheeses. And again, put that in the oven, serve it with crusty bread. It's an amazing cheese. And again, it's, you know, it's a packaging that you can save. I have people use it as a candle holder. Um, you know, I make creme brulee in those little crocks. So just a lovely approachable cow's milk cheese with a geotricum rind on it. So why don't we try this? Mm. Wow. Mine is very young. I get the sweet corn, the fresh fluffy texture. Um, it's it's lovely. Wow, a little bit of hazelnut, a little acidity, not too much. You can taste the salt. This is just such a nice flavor. It's very mm. simple. It's got some earthiness to it. It's really got a really nice balance. So I'm going back to where you started, and I'm going with a cider. Oh. Right? So this is a Tennessee cider. This is a. a uh, Gypsy Circus Cider Company, and this is their Rain Dancer. And this is a, an amazing semi-dry uh, cider with this, which is, you know, this reminds me a little bit of a, a French Camembert or a Normandy Camembert. Mm, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it has, yeah, I agree. It has this sweet corn, buttermilk, Acidity coming from the lactic cheese um, and a little bit of yeastiness that comes from the geotricum or the bilinans that will be um, in, in true camembert, French camembert. Mm -hmm. Wow, it's been. Mm -hmm. You know, Michael, it's my first time doing this. <laughs> and I'm so glad that I did it. I'd like, I get to. You know, enjoy a beautiful cheese board. I had some great cider. My kids have been locked down in front of the TV. <laughs> They're like, Mom, we want to go have snack with you. I said, No, no, you can't come. It didn't rain and the bear didn't show up. I think we call this a win. <laughs> they did. Yeah. Um, yeah, I got uh, lightning thunder, two dogs underneath my feet. So, uh, it was uh, a little chaotic for a couple seconds there. You know, here in Tampa, uh, usually if we get a, a, an ounce of rain, we lose power somewhere along the line. So I got, we got really lucky and everything worked out really well. And it's so nice to sit down with you. It's been way too long. And I hope that we can do this again uh, on some more cheeses because, uh, you know, it's always fun to sit down and try different things. And these pairings, are virtually unlimited. We didn't even right. put the charcuterie in here. So oh gosh, and chocolate? And mm. chocolate. I do have some chocolate somewhere in here, you know, and I have some nuts in here. So, you know, we could, we could just spend all day playing with the food. Yeah, yeah. It's been lovely. It's been lovely. Well, thanks so much for having me. I, you know, talking about cheese and what we do and the importance that 
you know, not what we do, but those cheese represent to our community and our dairy, you know, ecosystem is, is so important. And the more people know where their food comes from, uh, I think the more, um, the more we're going to, we're going to come back and thrive as a, as a food system. So thanks so much for having me, Michael. It's been a pleasure. And, um, Cheers to you all and happy uh, American Cheese Month, right? American Cheese Month. We're finishing Cheers it up to and... American Cheese Month. Yeah. Yes. Cheers to you. And Thank you. You're welcome. So everybody else, I want to let you know that she has left us with a really great video at the end here. So uh, I'm going to play that so you can see some of the history and uh, hear it from Allison and Bob themselves. So that's really fun. Uh, the rest of the month and into, into June, there's more American artisan and also be bringing some English cheesemakers onto the screen uh, in June and July. So looking forward to that. You guys have a great night. And Emily, thank you so much. Love you. And uh, we'll see you again soon. Merci. Bye-bye.